This is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to this week's show. Before we begin today's show, I want to take a quick moment and thank our sponsor, Hired.com. You know, it's a good time to be a software developer, but it's an even better time to be an Android developer. I'm not just saying that because most of our listeners are Android developers, but really the demand for Android developers today is pretty high. So the question is, uh, okay, I'm an Android developer. How do I find a good job? Well, that's where Hired.com comes in. As soon as you sign up, you can get interview requests within a week. And each of these offers come with a salary and equity up front. So you know in advance if it's even worth spending your time on these interview requests. They also work with over 3,000 companies from startups to large public companies. So they have a really nice extensive pool from where you can get all these great offers. Now, signing up for Hire.com is totally free for you as a user. You don't pay anything. If you do land up getting a job uh, through them, they give you additionally a thousand dollar bonus just to say thank you. So that's great. But if you're a listener of the show, you deserve something extra special. So sign up with this special link, hire.com slash fragmented. When you do that, they double that bonus. So instead of thousand dollars, you get two thousand dollars when you accept a job. So if you do sign up with them, uh, please do sign up with our special link. And they know that you came from us and you'd help support the show. Thanks again to Hired for sponsoring today's show. Hello, hello. You know, I don't even know where to to, be, to tell you the truth. It's weird starting off like this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the For the listeners, we're trying something new this episode out. Um, we're introducing something, we're, I guess we're kind of internally. I, don't know, I like we're a company <laughs> or something, right? <laughs> Called the decompress uh, episodes or we're kind of decompressing. Uh, but long story short, where you understand that some of our episodes are pretty technically intensive mm-hmm. uh, in terms of content. So what we have noticed, though, is on those few times that, that me and you have gotten together uh, in San Francisco, New York, wherever, that we have ended up having conversations just kind of about like, hey, I'm doing this thing in RX. Does this sound right? Or am I doing this like completely the wrong way? And maybe you'll ask me a question and it kind of goes back and forth. And before you know it, we have like a few people that have amassed around us and we've kind of building this larger conversation and people find it very interesting. Uh, so I'm not saying that we are uh, the best conversationalists in the world, but <laughs> oh, uh, <no. laughs> people have said, you know, this is the kind of stuff that you guys should have on the podcast. So we're going to try a couple of these episodes out to see how it goes. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that sounds right. And uh, as is always the case, if uh, folks have feedback, feedback on uh, things we can do to improve the way we are structuring these episodes or if they think it's a good idea, if they think it's a bad idea, then we are all ears. So do let us know. Yeah. So there's not really going to be a lot of format to these these episodes, really. It's just kind of us chatting about stuff that's uh, Android developer related in one way or another or things that we've noticed and we'll just kind of let it roll. Yeah, that makes sense. But before we start uh, today's decompress episode, uh, I do have a quick bit of follow-up that I want to cover. In episode 32, so this is basically the fragment that I released on trying to make sense about the Android support library version numbers. Oh, yeah. Uh, In the comments, we actually got two listeners give some great feedback. So Xan or Jan, I guess, uh, pointed out in the comment that actually I did make a mistake. So... In my in my rage about how the naming conventions are completely messed up, I did mention that app compat uh, technically should have been app compat v nine because it go the support goes back all the way to gingerbread, which is nine. I didn't actually test it out myself. I made that assumption from an intro blog post that uh, one of the other folks from uh, the support library teams actually mentioned. So. I looked at that and I was like, what the hell? <laughs> this should be app compat V9. Why didn't you just name it like that? But um, our listeners were, as usual, super sharp. And the they pointed out that actually app compat does go all the way to V7. And Jean actually tried, tested it, and he actually got the error. So if you try to put a min SDK version of 6, it'll actually fail. And if you change your min SDK to 7, it actually goes through. So that was my bad. I think that was, uh, I didn't test it. Anatoly... Uh, went one step even further and he actually pointed us to the uh, GitHub link directly where they actually do point where what the min SDK version is. So that was amazing. I, I just thought that was uh, really cool and I wanted to give a shout out to those two good listeners who made sure that they followed up with the right information. So 
just putting that information out there. Definitely. Big thanks to that. We appreciate it very much. We do. So you uh, <laughs> you had told me a couple of days ago that you were, you had at work, you got to be part of a uh, iOS boot camp. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So <laughs> for a brief period of time, I, uh, I went into the dark side. Um, <laughs> I mean, the true story is uh, at Instacart. So a couple of uh, uh, the folks from my team uh, who work on iOS, they were running this uh, small boot camp. This was just to encourage other engineers in our team to sort of get a feel of how mobile development is. So the iOS folks actually uh, set up a boot camp and just to show support and also like uh, for my team members. And also I was always just curious to see how things in the iOS development world are. I actually went in for the boot camp as well. Man, there were some things that I didn't even realize. Like people don't really understand like how I mean how nice Android Studio is and like you know how things can get really bad. For example, with Xcode, I was chatting with a couple of like my colleagues and the folks there and Xcode crashing is like a regular thing. So like every <laughs> every 3 days, 4 days, they're like, "Oh yeah, it, it could possibly crash just like we started and all everything will be fine." And I'm like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> and I kept trying to think about the parallel. Very rarely does Android Studio crash on me. We have it really nice with Android Studio <laughs> compared to stuff like Xcode. Did, did you ever use Eclipse back in the day for Android? I I have used Eclipse but not for Android development. So I I feel your pain partially, but I've heard it was really bad with Yeah, it's a whole other world of hell really. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people that love Eclipse. You probably listen to the show and I'm sorry if I offended you, but uh, I have this huge disdain for Eclipse uh, and that's the way it, it kind of was early really early on, like literally the first couple of releases of Android, the ADT plugin would something would work and all of a sudden it just wouldn't compile or the resources wouldn't be there. And you're like, I have no idea what's wrong. This code looks correct. It matches the sample. And then you would restart Eclipse and then all of a sudden it magically would work. And you're like, oh, great, thanks. And so a lot of times you'd get to this weird situation in your development cycle where you're like, okay, you know, hack away on some code. And then all of a sudden you get this red squiggly line or it wouldn't compile and you're like, okay, I don't know if it's me uh, or the code. And so you just, part of your regular cycle was just restarting Eclipse. Uh, so I can imagine the pain in Xcode, definitely. But I didn't know it was still that bad. Yeah, I mean, and this is like pretty recent. This isn't six months back or something. This is as good as like two or three weeks back. So I was super surprised. But just to be sure, I'm not saying we shouldn't complain even if Android Studio like gets a little flaky because we expect super high standards, right? And that's one way of enforcing it. Like if only if you care that much about your tools and you keep uh, well, complaining isn't necessarily the right word, but like constructive criticism, right? Politically correct. Keep, yeah. I mean, we expect the highest quality tools. And so I think it's completely fine to complain about things that don't work uh, in our way. But I just want to take a moment to, again, thank the good folks at the tools team, because like we have it definitely better. Oh, yeah. I uh, I remember when I first learned of IntelliJ and they had an Android plugin in IntelliJ. Um, I didn't know at the time and a colleague at the company I was working at showed me and I immediately jumped over to IntelliJ and was just extremely <laughs> happy over in IntelliJ once I got away from Eclipse. But uh, I have to agree with you here that when the announcement was made, the Android Studio was basically built on top of IntelliJ. Uh, I was like over the moon, happy, excited. So speaking of boot camps, did uh, how long was that boot camp? I think it was maybe half a day, uh, if I remember right. Again, it was tuned to our engineers. So, I mean, like many of the engineers who were attending were pretty senior engineers. So, I mean, they didn't go into necessarily the basics as regular boot camps were. It was sort of like an accelerated boot camp okay. where like it's only the things that are different about iOS that we covered. I will say one thing. Swift is really nice, but oh, damn, Objective-C, it's as hurtful to the eyes as it always has been yeah <laughs> so it's like crazy talk like you know people complain about java and verbosity in java i'm like are you kidding me like look at objective c like <laughs> i mean i don't have it you cannot complain with a straight face about java when you have objective c looking like that so anyway I, we don't want to go into the holy wars next week kaushik is starting a new podcast called the apple show i will not be a part of it <laughs> with a grand total of one listener <laughs> <laughs> Are you counting yourself? Or yeah, no? bro, myself. That's it. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of boot camps, have you heard of, you know, and I'm sure people in the Silicon Valley have heard of this, but have you heard of the boot camps where people go and they like learn mobile development and then just try to go get a job? Have you heard of those recently? I have. There are a couple of few. I don't remember the names specifically, but there are, yeah. I mean, that is a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember, I mean, 
Have you heard of the cost of some of these things, though? Do you know how much they cost? I I imagine they are not like a 50 buck coupon or something that you get free on the internet. They're, they're definitely pretty costly. At least that's what I've heard. But yeah. The I ones mean, that I have, like, I have seen it range anywhere from like the low end, which was like eight grand. Like, and I've heard them go all the way up towards like oh, 30 wow. or 40 grand. Oh, man. And, so this is almost like a degree kind of thing, right? I mean. Yeah, but I would be very leery of these things, you know, because it's like kind of like picking up a, a the book at the bookstore and like teach yourself programming in 24 hours. You know what I mean? Mm. Like there's only certain so much you can get out of it. Uh, and I have a feeling that a lot of people might be getting duped a little bit, which is kind of a sad thing. Uh, and I think a lot of that's starting to come out in the tech news that folks that come out of these boot camps really, you know, they can do some things, but they can't do uh, as much as their employers are expecting them that they can do, you know, if they've been kind of interesting. I guess it's, it depends on expectations though, right? Because uh, most folks like it does. They're like some super smart folk that just want to make a transition to the career and then they go into these boot camps because I have heard success stories as well. So, no, um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like I I know this guy on this other forum that I'm part of and he is a, uh, he's a doctor, you know, a medical doctor and he would just got tired of the medical industry. He's like, you know what? I'm writing my own. He's actually doing web stuff, but you know, I taught myself uh, rails or whatever and I've created this, you know, software as a service application and he's, you know, changing his career. And so wow. one of those situations where, like you said, they're smart and can get stuff done. Yeah. I mean, so there's a very slim chance that you will be recruited as a senior software engineer just with your experience from these boot camps. So that expectation has to be set down. So as long as you uh, can can write left padding and publish it to NPM, you should be all right. Put a library up there, get it up uh, on GitHub or NPM. You're super famous. <laughs> the next thing you know. You pull it down and then you break half the internet, right? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. So speaking about IDEs, Android Studio and all this stuff, these are like really smart uh, senior Android engineers that, uh, you know, I highly respect. I've seen many of them don't use Android Studio's like layout preview. I was curious and I wanted to bring it up with you. Uh, do you use the layout preview, Android Studio's layout preview, as you develop your UIs, or are you just straight up fully like? Have you become so accustomed to just how the XML would turn out that you don't even need the layout preview and you go straight up into uh, Java? Dude, I'm in the matrix. I just see XML and it turns into code. You know, <laughs> you just no. visualize it in your head, and then it just like as you see, this <laughs> translates into XMLs with perfect gravity and layout attributes. Yeah, just like little characters, little bracket tags is just coming down. So no, anyway, um, well, the, the clarification on that. Do you mean, there's actually two different previews you can look at. There's like the designer, you could treat that as a preview. And then there's like the preview panel. Which one are you talking about? Oh, no, I mean the preview panel. I don't okay. mean, the, yeah, I don't mean it. the usual tab text and design, which I think more often than not, almost 90% of us have it switched to text per Permanently. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mean that uh, preview. I don't mean editing the layout in the design preview mode. I mean just w seeing the preview uh, window side panel. Thing. Okay. Yeah. The reason why I asked that is because some people use that designer as a preview, and I've seen that happen. So uh, to answer your question, yes, I do use the preview. Mm -hmm. and so the preview panel and have the XML open and edit it. So I've been doing that for as long as I can remember. And I remember when it was first announced, I was just elated over the moon. Uh, so yeah, I'm surprised that you've encountered a lot of people who haven't used it. Me too. So I mean, I'm like right now the count is like four or five. And these are not just Whoa. regular, like these are really super smart <laughs> Android engineers. And almost all of them told me they don't even use the layout preview. And the reason uh, I thought this was interesting is because I swear by this thing, especially I like how uh, there's a toggle right on top where you can say show the preview for a whole bunch of devices. So you can have like tablets, you can have like old devices thrown there. And granted, these aren't super accurate, but they're accurate enough to be constructive for you to move forward in your development. So so you're saying, I guess, uh, at this point that you do use it as well. So Yeah, I do use it. Yeah, maybe I should we should try to find one of these uh, people that don't use it and try to like pick their mind and see what the rationale there is. I use it um, and I like I'm like you, I treat it kind of like follow the whole 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of, I trust it for 80% uh, of what I think is going to happen. Like, like right now I'm looking at a view for a client app and I was developing a one of the recyclers, recycler view item, like kind of like a row. And I've used the, the preview all this morning developing it and 
uh, I, I kind of believe that that's gonna, it's going to be pretty accurate. And then I'll just, you know, kind of run it on an emulator or a device or whatever, just as the last few sanity checks and last few tweaks. Is that what you do too? Or do you do something different? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. No, that's my exact flow. So I, 80% of the way, I'll just get there looking at the layout uh, preview. And then the last 20%, obviously, there are certain tweaks that you just have to get it up on the emulator or something. And I take it from there. So speaking of uh, looking at XML and, and a bunch of code, um, you sent me a message on Slack this week saying that you had to bump up your font size because I used to give you some crap about that when I saw you in New York City. <laughs> that is true. And I felt a little ashamed because I, I don't know if it's maybe just age <laughs> taking its toll on me or something, or maybe it's just uh, my sanity coming back to me. <laughs> maybe this is like a bad habit that I picked up as a kid. Uh, essentially, what I used to do is I used to make my font size as small as humanly possible where it would be legible enough and <laughs> yeah. at the same time uh i would also like my screen resolution i used to keep it super uh small and i guess my rationale there was i need to see as much as uh, i can see of like the codes so if i have a file open just to get good context like i need all of the stuff to be visible and so i bumped up the font size and life got like 5x better just <laughs> immediately. And I also wanted to bring it up with you because I feel also my ideas of like uh, development have changed because now I've, I've gone to the other edge, right? So at any point of time when I'm coding, I only want to see a small method in front of me that takes care of things, right? I don't want to see, actually, I feel it's detrimental to have to think about more than what's just right in front of you. So I thought that was interesting. And I don't know, maybe... This is like a revelation that hit me way too late. And this was your motive all the way. Because I remember you were the one who mentioned, you said to just bump up your font size. And then I'm telling you, you your, your life will get significantly better. And you were totally right. It just took me maybe like eight months to realize that. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't start that way. I was the same as you. I would try to shrink everything down. I mean, make everything as small as possible on the screen, highest resolution. So I could have everything. I wanted all the context. And then... One day, this is probably, man, like 2003 or four, maybe a long time ago. Um, when I'm at work and I can't look at the screen, like if, imagine sitting there looking at the computer, writing some code and all of a sudden, like the screen just starts going back and forth. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm not even moving. Like what's going on? Like, wow. Like did someone spike my drink kind of thing? <laughs> and I'm, I look away and I kind of look outside the window and my vision's fine. And then I'm like, oh, that's weird. And I'll go back to work. And five minutes later, the computer starts shaking again. And it's my eyes. And I did a bunch of research and found out it was a couple of things. It's A, because usually you're tired, uh, which I probably was. And then B, because I am I was straining my eyes too hard. And so I just found like, all right, well, take the font size and bump it up by two or whatever until it was comfortable. And at first it felt like I was like, like I had a jitterbug phone. You remember those commercials, like the jitterbug phones? This holiday season, complicated is out. Simple is in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do, I do. <laughs> I felt like the developer with a jitterbug phone, you know, and I'm like, you know, like I need big fat buttons or something. I'm like, oh man, this is so embarrassing. But then eventually I realized like, I don't need to see that image view or whatever else is is 12 lines up. I'm not focused on that right now. I don't need to see my entire file structure. Like this is all, what's happening is it's, it's uh, sensory overload and there's too many inputs going on. And so as soon as I eliminated that, it was much better. And so now I have a couple of, uh, for example, in Android Studio, I'll have a couple of, of preferences settings. Uh, what's it called here? The schemes set up. And I call mine like dark yellow plus. And then I'll create a new one. And then I'll use the, I think I use the Menlo font is what I default to. And I have the size 14 as my font. I don't know. What do you use? Do you know? Spent way too much time, probably more than what people would deem healthy. Uh, I usually switch between two fonts. Uh, the one that I primarily use is, uh, and I think I mentioned this in a previous episode. So it's a Consolas. Yep. I've used Consolas. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's actually a font that was built by Microsoft. And the other one that I've been using uh, recently is uh, Fira Mono, which I think is uh, an open source font that was released by uh, the folks at Mozilla. Oh, okay. And it's very similar to Consolas. It's a little more stylish so it has a little more character so now and then if i get a little bored then i switch but by and large it's only these two fonts and i used to do uh 12 12 used to be my regular font size i've been bumping it up to 14 and 15 on android studio there's this weird that's that's one problem at least with the whole intellij line of editors the font rendering is not uh, entirely very accurate there's basically like where you have to make sure that 
the SDK uh, that's used for IntelliJ is basically 1.8, Java 1.8. Uh, there's some like minor annoyances with that, but I feel the font rendering is not perfect. So I bump it to 15 on uh, Android Studio, but my terminal, iTerm, Atom, like the editor, all the other things, uh, I basically keep it at 14. So it's pretty similar now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty much right in the, in the same ballpark. But yeah, so now ever since then, I rarely have, the only time I'll have like weird like eye issues is if I'm extremely exhausted for whatever reason, but it uh, makes life a lot easier too. And the other thing is like, it's another tip that I give people when they're doing this too, is if for some reason you're the kind of person that likes the light colored theme of your IDE, mm-hmm. which a lot of people coming from like .NET re- are used to Visual Studio and Visual Studio has this very bright white theme or at least it did when i was using it or xcode it, yeah even xcode's default is pretty exactly white. and so what happens is it's so much light going into your eyes that it's it's overbearing and so what i advise is to at least in the code editor you can go in and change the background color of the code editor assuming you still like that light colored theme change the background color of the code editor to like a light brown or a light gray and that will actually reduce the strain on your eyes too all right so just recently, I was um, running a new app for a client, uh, a small client on the East Coast, and um, I noticed that I needed to write some tests because I was, I was starting to lose confidence of what I was doing. Uh, changes were starting to break, and uh, yeah, I'm guilty. I didn't write the test first, um, but that's just kind of the nature of the beast, and I wanted to see what your thoughts on this were because what I found is certain clients have a certain budget, and I can let them know, like, look, we can build this now and we'll get it done but we're going to probably have a lot of bugs or b we could spend a little bit more money up front build the test for it make sure that we don't have uh, as many bugs uh, and in the end it will be cheaper and what i usually find is they opt for the first one is that we don't want any tests we just want this done as soon as possible and i started thinking like why is it so problematic to set up tests it's not really that hard anymore Android Studio and the file structure allow us to add tests fairly fairly easily. And then I realized that the real problem lies in the external dependencies. And that's going to be the data for your app. That's going to be the API that you need to consume and so forth. What do you think about that? Have you ran into that situation before too? Well, absolutely. So I have a couple of thoughts there. So the first one is... This is a little tricky because uh, you primarily work as a consultant, right? Uh, I, I've rarely worked as a consultant, so I can understand where this might be a little different. I'm more and more convinced these days that I don't even ask if I should be writing tests. Like, I don't even tell them I'm writing tests. I just write, go ahead. Like, if I'm building a feature, I just write the test. And sometimes it takes longer than uh, they would assume uh, that it should, like, how long it should take. And I just tell them, no, it took that long. That's that's it. Because I found that the argument with testing, especially with people who don't uh, develop or who haven't, and even uh, people who haven't faced the pain of uh, not having tests, it, it's a very hard argument to make. And you're basically going to a client and saying, would you like your product out in three days or would you like your product out in one week? That's all they hear. And I mean, I don't fault them for that because it is their objective and their role as, I don't know, product managers or project managers to try and see how how they can get the app out as fast as possible. So this was something that I heard Martin Fowler say in like a previous talk or something. Uh, I don't even convince them that we need to write tests. I just go and do it. I can take that liberty a little more just because I've been at the company long enough where they trust me to do things the right way so they don't don't go crazy. Like if I I go join and the very first day I just start doing that, well, it's hard, right? It it seem, it doesn't seem like the right thing to do. So yeah, I, I completely agree with you, and I think you, in your situation, that is the the perfect thing to do. And even in, uh, I have clients that are like that. For example, I'm doing some consulting for American Express right now, and um, there's no question over there that when you write code, you write tests. Like that's just how it goes. Like you, did, there's no if ands buts about it. But uh, when I come to it from, like you said, like a consulting perspective, uh, I have to come talk to usually you know ceos of companies and convince them like look we're going to spend a significant amount of money building this app they realize it they have a budget uh and then i have to be able to say all right well we can like you said we can get it done in three days or we can get it done in a week and of course it's not going to be that fast but we're just hypothetically speaking uh what ends up happening is i have to look at it from a business perspective too because a i may need this client because i'm trying to fill a pipeline of work that i need because as a consult running a consulting career uh and i said all right well I can get you in for a week um, and then 
you know, we're going to run into issues. And I'll, I'll let them know saying, hey, if we don't have tests, we're going to run into bugs. It's going to be more expensive in the long run. Um, but what they end up doing is just like you said, is they look at the bottom line. All right, how much is this going to cost? And is this something that uh, that I can deal with? And or can we wait till later? So it's just a weird thing. I just wish that the problem of setting up external dependencies like the databases, the APIs and everything was a easier problem to solve than it is currently. Right. And that uh, to that point, one thing that I've found is I usually try to I pay the piper up front and that's why any project even if it's like relatively small i just like add dagger in without like any question because i found just having dagger in there like it makes it again it's not easy to your point it still is a little more effort it isn't it doesn't just come for free but it's it's far more lower the bar is far more lower to get external dependencies in when you have something like dagger it also just depends on how like you've coded it up to begin with right i mean if you if you have not written your code in a way that lends itself easily to be uh, injected using dependencies, then you're going to run into that problem, I guess, right? Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, it is how, you, how you've written it. And especially in consulting, you come in and you take over legacy code, code bases a lot of time. And you're just like, wow, like, I don't even know where to begin <laughs> testing this thing. Like, it's impossible. And right. you talk to the other developers and you ask them, like, hey, how do we you know, <laughs> test this? We're like, we'll just fire up the app and, and, and test it. And they're like, <laughs> like face palm time. We're like, okay, all right, I got it. Okay, no problem. It is testing. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't argue that. All right. And I guess the final topic that uh, we're going to talk about today is one that I guess both of us are super excited about and one that's very recent. Yeah. Google basically open sourced this library called Agera. Do you think I'm pronouncing that right? Agera? Agera, Agera, I don't know. Agera. Agera. <laughs> <Age raw. laughs> um, and the interesting thing with Agera is essentially it's a reactive programming library for Android. So this is why it makes it really, really interesting. And the whole of the internet was up in arms uh, yesterday. But I thought this was a very good topic to discuss. Again, I don't think we're going to go into the details of how Agera works and necessarily like the different constructs. We'll have an independent, I think it deserves like an independent episode uh, where we do a more deep dive. But I'd like to talk about just the fact that Google uh, brought this in, like how do we feel about it and like the different sort of thoughts. What were your first thoughts? Yeah, uh, my initial first thought, I saw reactive programming. I took a look at the example and I immediately, well, a little background before this, like this isn't a thing that, that Google created out of nowhere. This is actually, from what I saw, it's running in billions of devices already. It basically it powers like Google Play movies and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and they just decided to kind of, Say, all right, look, we've been using it. It works for us. You know, here it is, open source community. But when I did see it, I thought to myself, I'm like, wait a second. I'm like, this totally suffers from like not invented here syndrome. <laughs> uh, that yeah. was like the first thing in my mind. I'm like, why? There's so many other things that already do this. Why are we recreating the wheel here? And and, and I wasn't trying to be negative. It's just my initial reaction to it. Did you feel anything of that at all? I think the big, whole, huge, giant white elephant in the room is like, well, we have Rx Java, and yeah. I, at this point, I I would find it extremely hard to imagine that the folks who worked on Agera haven't heard of Rx Java, right? Like, there's no way in hell they haven't heard about Rx mm -hmm. Java. So. I think the gut reaction for most people was like, wait, we already have RxJava. Like, what are you trying to do? Why you have another library, right? Uh, but obviously, once the, the first five or 10 seconds of like rage sort of settled down, then uh, the more and more you think about it. For example, you did mention that this is something that they've always had in place, right? There were a couple of other points that I also like thought were super interesting. One is we should be encouraging this. Like, this is a huge thing for us in two ways. One it means Google is thinking in the same direction because the whole reactive programming is very, very different uh, from imperative programming or like the regular kind of thinking. So the fact that Google has open sourced a library means that they're giving legitimacy to this argument that there is a place for reactive programming. And that, that actually made me super happy. And I, and it was sad because I didn't see anyone sort of like celebrate that fact, right? Yeah, it's... It, yeah, reactive programming is completely different. I mean, folks that, you know, I spent a lot of time at Realm this last year, and I mean, Realm is built completely for reactive programming. And so there's a lot of people that are starting to hop into it. So it's it's cool that they're exposing it like, even more. Now, there's a slight difference in that there's already a very mature library in place. 
let's think about the hypothetical situation right like what would we have ideally liked would we have ideally liked if google just started using rx java and then like got rid of uh, uh this agera thing and do you think that was ever like a possibility i don't know it really depends on how long that this agera stuff has kind of been in google it may have been in there for so long that it kind of was just built internally and then rx kind of was coming up at the same time and that's a very good possibility and they're like well we already use ours let's let's stick with ours and then rx kind of took off in the community and let's face it google is a very large enterprise they're right. not a startup they exactly things need to get done uh people need there need to be standards there has to be process otherwise everything just falls apart in a large company so there's so many possibilities of of why this is chosen but this really reminds me of the days when remember when volley was released like open oh, source yeah, yeah. so this is like a very much a volley type of thing in my opinion because we had there's so many other tools out there that did what volley did already and in my opinion way better you know and to this day there's you know still tools that do a lot of things better in volley so i'm not saying that rx is better than agara um it does look very uh, young at this point in time and solves a particular niche problem uh but Uh, it's interesting to see where this is going to go because I'm not exactly sure yet. There are some problems with RX Java, right? Like, and usually people are celebrating RX Java, but there a the learning curve is steep. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no denying that. RX Java has a very steep learning curve. Even for us to this day, there are things that we discover that we didn't know before. You hear Dan Liu, you hear Jake Wharton, you hear all these like fine developers, and even sometimes they are debating decisions of should we go this route, should we go that route with RX Java. So clearly it isn't something that's meant to be picked up easily right and that's a big ding against it and if agera makes this sort of reactive programming easier for people who are new to this sort of like paradigm or new to development in general then I'm all for it also there's the question of method count like rx java has like a huge method count and I don't know how cool google will be with that yeah i mean the whole method count thing i have a diff- i have a, i could turn that to a whole episode itself but um True. i have different opinions than most people on that the um Do I see here's how I'm thinking about it right now uh pretty much live thinking here. If I were to walk into a client and they had a gear how would I feel about that? I don't know how I would feel. I'm not enough familiar with it. I think I'd be happy that there is some reactive stuff there. Um but at the same time I wouldn't be able to harness my existing tool set to uh move fast, you know? So how do we feel about Google open sourcing this versus if somebody else open sourced this, right? Now historically we have to understand google has some excellent third party libraries there's no denying that we use app compact the support libraries i think they do a phenomenal job they do one, like a one of the finest jobs in keeping this library up to date giving functionality they're doing a perfect job there the difference is they have complete control over it right so mm-hmm. google is great about third party libraries they're not that great about open sourcing necessarily right Yeah it is and I think one of the I think I saw a comment on Reddit yesterday that said someone mentioned this exact topic and they said well here's a case in point of why you guys are doing open source wrong because someone said look there's this pull request that fixes this issue and then the comment was from someone from Google that said oh yeah that's cool it looks great as soon as we pull it back down internally then we'll push it back up and then someone's like that's not how open source works <laughs> I mean that's totally true like dagger is another example right when Dagger 1 was under the helm of Square. It was great. Like people would make public uh, PRs contributions and you would know immediately if it was going in or if it was not going in, right? Which is not to say they would just simply accept anything that the community comes in, but they would be very good about having a reasonable discussion in the open saying, "Yes, this is our thought process and we think this would work, this won't work." Google, I don't think necessarily does the same thing. I'm not saying they should do the same thing because maybe it doesn't work for them. But we clearly have to recognize that this is a major fault on their end. Yeah. And uh, but I'd also like to play devil's advocate too here on, here on Google side like let's be honest like Google is just comprised of people like you and I and a lot of a lot of people that are in there a lot of developer relations teams a lot of people that are I mean I've worked with people that are on uh, the engineering team in Android and they're just regular people and those people want a lot of these things to be open source and what it comes down to is like is politics and legalities and lawyers that say well yeah For we sure. can't let that be on open for xyz reasons it has to go through this legal process and this is the case for a lot of companies and i have a feeling that there's so much red tape that goes on behind the scenes that we don't know about and we will never hear about that it's a lot of the reasons and uh, unfortunately some of the dev relations teams uh, take the brunt of that a lot unfortunately 
Uh, and so, A, good job to you guys for, you know, keeping your head up and, and uh, smiling throughout the difficult process. <laughs> but uh, I do want to let other people know that we have to consider that while it may not be perfect and Google does need to do a little bit better job, there are some problems internally that they're probably having to work through that we're not aware of. Right, right, right. And I do actually want to point out, uh, as we speak, like Agera, uh, Jesse Wilson, friend of the show, actually sent in a pull request. It's, it was a pretty small pull request. And actually, that's the last pull request that I see where he's changed the uh, default character set of HTTP. Oh, yeah. And and they merged that in. So <laughs> uh, We have to just let this kind of stuff evolve and see where it goes. The only tips uh, that I would really like the, the, I guess, the Agera team to take home right now, given where they are, is from a learning perspective, you know, having written you know, many books and tutorials and articles and magazines, articles and all kinds of stuff. The one thing that I have learned is that you really have to start like stupid simple and then build up from there. So if you look at the example on the Agara homepage, which we'll put in the show notes, you'll see that there's like all kinds of stuff going on. Like when you look at it, you're like, you're like, whoa, like brain explode. Like I have no idea what's going on here. Um, so if you, if they broke it down a little bit simpler, like, all right, here is, you know, an example of you want to go from A to B. Here's how you're going to do that in Agarit. Now let's build on that. And it takes more time to write that documentation, yes. But what that does is it drives user adoption because then more people can say, oh, I see how this works now. And uh, I think that would be a good thing that they could implement, hopefully. Do you think it's just the nature of like reactive programming that makes it difficult to sort of lend itself? Or do you think they can actually do a better job with these examples? Because I had a very similar thought with RH Java, right? I thought, well, I could write an intro blog series, but then Dan Lu, uh, Dan is obviously great at this kind of stuff, right? Like breaking down concepts. And I thought like, well, that's that's already there. So which is why I came with the examples repository where you have like small examples, real world examples that you can just adapt. But I'm not so sure. Like, is it just that reactive programming is a complicated concept where like it's hard to explain it without going into some level of complexity? I think it is uh, a little more difficult to explain it because of the complexity, you know, it requires people to think a little bit backwards than what they're used to. They're very used to procedural stuff. And as soon as you kind of do this reactive thing, like, all right, well, now we're just going to kind of hang out and wait for things to happen. It's a simply, it's a completely different way than you have normally done things. So it does require an additional layer of explanation, which is include some complexity, but you can break that down to where it's easy enough. You just have to find the right concepts to to understand it. Uh, and what you also need to do is in most learning, you need to find, you need to grab onto something that somebody already knows so you can show them this relation. It gives them this natural neural pathway to jump between saying, oh, I understand this. And then you show them, here's how you do it like this. Like, oh, I kind of see what's happening now. And it builds that, that learning pathway. All right. So I think that was fun. Uh, if listeners want to reach out to you, Don, how do they do that? My phone number. No, I'm just kidding. Not happening. <laughs> it's five. It's, uh, you got to reach. Best way to get a hold of me, and I say this at conferences, as you can you can email me through my website. But if um, I probably won't get it back to you for a few days um, because it's just a backlog of email. So hit me on Twitter at Don Felker. Uh, but if you do need something longer form, you can definitely try to email me. Uh, it just be a little bit while before I reply. It's not uh, no disrespect. Just trying to catch up. Yep. Uh, totally the same way. My Twitter handle is Kaushik Gopal. And more often than not, I'm much more punctual with my replies there. So feel free to hit us up there. Uh, Fragmented Cast is our Twitter handle for Fragmented Podcast. So if you shoot us a tweet there, we'll definitely reply there. Or we do have our contact form. So that's fragmentedpodcast.com slash contact. And we do have a Slack channel uh, as part of the spec uh, network. So feel free to hit us up there and we will get back to you. Before we go, though, I'd really like to say thank you to this episode's sponsor, Hired. If you use the link hired.com slash fragmented, you'll actually be able to double that initial $1,000 thank you bonus if you get a job through Hired, making it a $2,000 bonus if you accept that job through hired.com. Again, that's going to be hired.com slash fragmented. Thanks a lot, Hired. Thank you all for listening, and we'll catch you next week.